Just a little housekeeping. I want to thank the sponsors that helped mm -hmm. this year. Yes. Uh, of course, Neil is our moderator from the uh, American Legion Post, but uh, McCulloch's Quick Stop, Mills Hardware, myself, the BRI, and um, I'm getting everybody. There's somebody. McCulloch's BRI, Mills Hardware, myself, and, and you. Uh, you said that. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, we, we, we got together to raise the money to put this thing on. So go, go you know, help those those people out that are, you know, that are putting the money in, you know, because uh, we want to keep the tradition going. So. I want to thank you for growing up with a bat and getting some money. Mm -hmm. I was very, very good at it. Anybody else? I mean, we're looking for money from Bethel University, too, so if anybody wants to pony. You know, we're, we're very lucky to have three or four, or sometimes four, as many as four legislators here. Yeah. Um, other towns, according to Dick, have done this and terminated it because of lack of attendance. And uh, I'd like to see a couple of people from the Walden area because uh, we want to reach out to those folks and try to get one of your legislators. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the format is not changed. Uh, we'll talk about anything you want to talk about, uh, as long as it's uh, uh, as long as it's not uh, uh, too too uh, hard to deal with. Uh, I, we want to keep this happy, simple, this election year. A lot of people have lots of ideas, and uh, they're not always good. So keep it calm. Uh, if you don't keep it calm, I'm going to ask you to leave. Uh, kind of so. uh, one of the things that I would like to call your attention to, if you haven't noticed, in the back of the Herald, uh, every week uh, during the legislative session, they publish a list of proposed bills and I'm not suggesting we follow this by any means, but if you're if you're having some difficulty uh, with what's happening in, in the legislature, looking at this quickly won't do you any harm. You'll find a lot of it, um, and I think the legislators will agree it's garbage. Uh, it'll hold no place but here. Um, but if you see something there that really uh, tickles your fancy, it's well to bring it up here, or you can at least talk to somebody about it that knows more about it than before us. So, where would you like to start? We generally start with the, the legislators, tell us about what they're doing and that um, what committees they were on. That doesn't amount to a whole, whole lot, I guess, but this year it seems like everybody's got off to a pretty fast start. So, Dick, if you would take a minute. Sure. Um, I think I know everybody, but I'm Dick McCormick, uh, state senator from Windsor, the Windsor County District, which is all of Windsor County, and the towns of uh, Londonderry, which is a Wyndham County town, and Mount Holly, which is a Rutland County town. And that is for the constitutional requirement that there be a, um, within 10% of, of the ideal that each senator would be representing um, one 30th of the state's population. So Windsor County, to get to, to qualify for three senators, has to pull into other towns. Um, and they don't like it. They feel that they've been kidnapped, but there it is. Uh, Allison Clarkson and uh, Alice Mitka are <coughs> the two senators. I serve uh, in the morning, in the Senate here on two committees. My morning committee is Health and Welfare, and the afternoon committee is Appropriations. Uh, you may remember from high school that all appropriations have to begin in the House, because the House is closest to the people. 
that in smaller districts there are more representatives. They are closer to the people, and so they are the ones who have to initiate any tax and any uh, spending. But we do have two houses, and so the, the Senate has to approve it in the end. Uh, so we're on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, right now, let me do the appropriations first. We're, um, we meet in the afternoon. Uh, we are completing our work on the Budget Adjustment Act. Vermont is on a <coughs> fiscal year, runs July 1 to June 31st. So we've been in fiscal year 2020 since July. And um, uh, that, that budget is developed in the previous session. So the budget we're living under was developed about a year ago. And obviously no one can see the future. So the budget is based on the best estimates of where the future is going to go. And um, uh, Midway, which of course came on January 1st, is midway through that fiscal year, uh, we look at uh, where have things gone differently than we expected. And people will sometimes say, well, why don't you get it right the first time? Well, I think about it. You, pretty much everything gets subject to some kind of adjustment as you go along, you know, uh, in, in, in any project that involves anticipating the future. The guesses of where the future was going to go are not random off the top of the head guesses. They're largely projections based on what had been the, the, the trends um, uh, up until the time the budget was passed. Uh, we have budget advisors. The budget actually, we say the Constitution it begins in the House. Really, the, the budget begins in the governor's office. The governor provides a recommended budget, which people even just, they don't even refer to it as the, the some call it the governor's recommend. But usually, it's just called the budget, even though it's not, because it hasn't been passed yet. And, and that's the template from which the House works. And then the Senate makes its adjustments to the, to the House version. But uh, well, sometimes, th something costs more than we thought it would. Sometimes things don't cost what we thought they cost. Uh, and there's a little extra money. Sometimes revenue falls short. Um, this year, we've actually had, had a, a good, comparatively good revenue year. Uh, and of course, then people will say, well, if you've got more money coming in than you expected, just do a tax refund. Don't, don't, you don't have to spend it. It's not burning a hole in your pocket. But decisions not to spend money, when we wrote the original budget, the decision not to spend uh, a certain amount of money on a certain uh, uh, expense does not necessarily mean that it wasn't a good idea to, to tend to that expense. It just meant we didn't have the money. You can't afford it. And you, when you don't have the money, you tighten your belt. And But there are things that, that probably did need money. Um, we had, for example, we, we made weatherization contingent on whether or not there was, there was money. And so, so now if you've got the money, then that means you can do this thing that you, you thought you couldn't afford to do. So the Budget Adjustment Act is just what the name implies, uh, that where, where it, it is adjusting the budget. Um, there was no real controversy. I don't think in the House there was any real controversy. There are years where there is some, some controversy. In this case, it really is a matter of adjustments. and. Uh, um, the, the pluses and my little less here, a little more there. Basically, it's the budget that was passed uh, last year. Uh, the bill has passed out of the Appropriations Committee and is pending the vote in the House. It has passed out. It's, it's, it's on its way to you. Okay, and so um, it'll come first to the Appropriations Committee and then finally to the, to the full Senate. We are already looking at the uh, 2021 uh, but remember years ago, my brother Kurt said, being in the legislature, you, you feel like you're aging quickly. But I'm already looking at, at, at next year, the, the 2021 budget. Um, that is the, the budget on, on which the governor um, gave his speech last week. This is the abridged version. This is the cliff notes on, on the budget, which was my weekend reading. Um, in health and welfare, uh, someone mentioned the nursing shortage. Vermont is 5,000 nurses short of what we need. I, my granddaughter Zoe is a nursing student. And I said to her, "You have." She was going to be an actress. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "You have chosen wisely. You know, just make sure you stay with it." Uh, we have uh, a labor shortage in general. 
uh, people talk about the, the the shrinking population. I get a lot of emails that the reason the population is shrinking, and it's shrinking slightly, it's not as though there's a flood by here, but people are leaving Vermont in droves. No, they're not. Some are leaving. Uh, and young people have been leaving Vermont since they opened the Erie Canal, frankly. The, um, uh, because the action is out there. You know, that's the bright lights. Or even farmers, you know, as soon as the West opened up, you know, eight feet of topsoil was a lot more inviting to farmers than our rock red New England hills, uh, that, which are good for poets, but difficult to farm. Uh, the, uh, I actually met a kid from Indiana who wanted to farm in Vermont. I said, go, go back to Indiana. Uh, the, uh, but we, we are experiencing, as rural communities throughout the nation <coughs> are experiencing, is, is a, a loss of population. It is a problem. I see it up close and personal. My stepdaughter uh, and, and her husband own and operate Village Pizza over on Route 14. And uh, my wife, Cindy, loves babysitting the grandchildren. But it's not just for fun. It is that they, the business doesn't run without her because people, if one person calls in sick, they're short, because they're already functioning on the skeleton crew. Yeah, hard. What's that? You can't find anybody. You can't find anybody, yeah. So I mean, it, it, is, it is a problem. Uh, the general reaction of all of my colleagues is that we need to um, increase the population of the state. Um, there is uh, some research out of the University of Iowa called Shrinking Smart which takes it, our, our equation right now is shrinkage causes problems, therefore we need to do away with shrinkage. What they're saying in Iowa is shrinkage causes problems, therefore figure out a way to deal with the problems. And I don't know if they're right or not. I, I'm, I'm interested. I always like different ideas, so I'm at least looking into it. Um, it does seem that a, a shrinking population should lower housing costs, for example, just law supply and demand. I don't know if that works or not. doesn't appear to be working in Vermont. But, um, in, in, in any case, we, we are looking at, at, at the, the nursing shortage in health and welfare, specifically the nursing shortage, but in general, the legislature is looking at the population issue in general. Um, the issue that we're dealing with right now in health and welfare is um, vaping and flavored tobacco products. And when, you know, vaping, they, they we're being told by the supporters of vaping that it's just, it's a, a smoking cessation tool. But then I, then you got to wonder, then why is one of the flavors called unicorn puke? Um, <laughs> they do seem to be aiming at, at, at kids. It seems to be a way to get um, kids to smoke. We had testimony last week about the history of the tobacco industry pitching menthol cigarettes specifically to black people. And uh, I can tell you 30 years ago, when I was a, a blues singer in Greenwich Village, I, I smoked menthols. <laughs> it, was, it just seemed cool, you know. I don't think I ever- It wasn't 30 years ago, it was longer than that. <laughs> Actually, you're right, you know, you're, you're right. No, it's it's, I've been in the Senate for, I'm so used to saying 30 years, thank you, Nate. 45. 50. 50. I can always count on you, Nick, thank you. <laughs> you're right. We wanted to be 30. <laughs> A friend of mine, Yvonne Daly, has written a book about the hippies in the 70s in Vader, yeah, right. and my picture is in the book from, from about them. And, and it's interesting to talk about getting good news and bad news in the exact same moment. Many, many people have told me how handsome I look in that picture. That's the good news. They're always, they always sound surprised when I say it. Like, yeah, you were actually handsome. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, uh, uh, the, the vaping, and of course that then raises the issue, okay, let's say vaping is bad for you, isn't it still an individual choice? And uh, I've got a, a, a libertarian streak. I, I often vote for more government regulation, but never happily. I, my starting position is, okay, less government, show me, show me why we have to do this. Often people can show me why they have to do it. But in any case, the, the vaping is a whole new issue. No, there was no vaping 20 years ago. I don't know when it first started. It's become very widespread only in the last several years. And um, 
there are health problems attached to it. You know, the lungs are supposed to breathe air. They're made to breathe air. They are not made to breathe anything else. And I say that as a, as a once dedicated cigarette smoker. And it's one of the, I, I know people who say, when, since I gave up cigarettes, I can't believe I ever smoked. The idea disgusts me. I haven't smoked in years. I don't have a day go by that I don't want a cigarette. So I, uh, believe me, I'm sympathetic to people who are addicted to tobacco. But it looks like vaping is, is another way to get more people addicted. So, and this is my colleague, Allison Clark Carson. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Hi. Sorry. Hi. I think Alice is just arriving. <clears throat> So I, I've just finished up mine. Uh, Sandy, you want to? Sure. Um, David, I believe that the videographer has asked that you trade seats with Allison so that the legislators are more in view. Alice, right, and here comes Alice. Okay, she I'm going to let Alice sit here. I'm going to move okay. somewhere right, 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 right. Videographer of rules. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, for you, for you. No, for you. No, for you. Oh, yes. So you can be on camera. <laughs> You're not on camera, you didn't have to. <laughs> good morning, Alice. Good morning. So, good morning, We're here. Um, So, I am Sandy Hawes. Um, I am in the house and I represent four towns Bethel, Rochester, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield, which is uh, uh, officially known as the Windsor Rutland District, which doesn't really mean anything to anybody. Um, and I serve on, uh, in the house, we serve on one committee all day, uh, and I am on Human Services, where I serve as vice chair. Um, and uh, I wanted to I wanted to start with um, something. So Neil uh, Neil talked about the uh, the list of bills that got, um, that the Herald reports every week the, the new bills that have been introduced. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind what 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 that means. Um, this time of year, when there's not a whole lot going on, the press loves to talk about. The, new, the newest bills, and particularly the most outrageous bills that have been introduced. Um, to date, in the, in, we're, in a, this, we're in the second year of the biennium, so, so everything that came in last year is still on the table, um, and we worked, we worked for two years on the same set of uh, issues. Um, uh, as a, I checked this morning, and there are 1,241 bills that have been introduced, and I believe that in a two-year biennium, we probably passed about 200 bills. So that gives you an idea um, of uh, how many of those ideas don't really get much attention. Um, so is there is there garbage in there? Yes, there probably is. I like to describe bills as, as slips of paper in a suggestion box. Um, we, have, we, have, we have colleagues who have, wake up in the middle of the night with wild and crazy ideas, and they call up the, our, let, our lawyers and they say, write this up for me. And so we get a lot of those. We also get, um, we also get bills that, that are way more serious, but that probably have a very long time um, uh, uh, trajectory. I've worked, on prod I've worked on issues that took 10 years to pass. So, you know, you got the bill in this year with, you know, with a handful of sponsors, and everybody says, oh, that's interesting, we should think about that. And then it comes in again the next term, two years later, and maybe it gets, and maybe it gets uh, you know, a couple of, you know, an hour of hearing. And then two years after that, maybe it gets serious consideration and makes it uh, out of a committee on one, one body or the other, but, but doesn't make it out of committee on the other side because, of course, Everything that we pass in the House has to go to the Senate and start all over again with the committee with the committee process and going to the floor. And not everything gets that kind of attention. So just as you as you read the, um, the fascinating articles about some of the bills that have come in this year, just keep in mind that they that m most of them are unlikely to have even an hour of testimony. Um, what you will see if you go on our website, which I've now lost, I was going to show it to you, um, is uh, if, you, if, you, if you're looking at what the committees are doing, sometimes you'll see that a committee has 10 bills uh, scheduled for the same half hour. What that, th those are what we call courtesy introductions. So, do you guys do those in the sen on the Senate side? Yeah. Well, it no? depends on the chair. Okay. I, okay. I get courtesies. <laughs> so so um, it, in, in my committee, it is our policy that we give we give every bill sponsor five minutes. Just it's just it's they are our colleagues. 
they put in this bill. Sometimes, often they'll come to us and say, oh, I'm just doing this for, for a constituent who has this problem and, you know, and, and you know, that, that's his issue, but I, but I felt like I wanted to put it in for him. Um, uh, sometimes they'll, you know, some, some of them are really pretty objectionable in one way or another. And we sit quietly, we sit in, um, respectfully for five minutes and let the bill sponsor make their pitch and then, uh, and then after we've, we've looked at all of those, we go around the room and try to figure out whether there are any of those that grab somebody in the room that they want to follow up on. Often what we do in my committee is, is one of those ideas, and they are just ideas, um, we'll say, oh, I like that part. And we're working on something else that we can fold it into. Last year we, were, um, we did a lot of work on the child care subsidy program. And I think we had six different bills. There was one from the administration that was that was at, that was requested by the administration. Um, there were some uh, there was there were some the ideas that were um, requested by providers who felt like the rules were too were too strenuous. Um, so that, so we had we had about six bills. We say on the wall because we um, we have a wall that has a little a little <coughs> index card with the name of the bill and the number, and we just and it's, and it's it's like our it's like our checklist of of, of our to-do list, um, and and then we did we did what we call a committee bill, which is to say that we started with a blank piece of paper in our in our legislative council, and we said what do, what do we want to address this issue? What do we want it to look like? And we went through all those six bills, and we said, oh, we, we need to talk about that. Oh, we need to talk about that. And we married all of those things in. And then interestingly, because the bill had a lot of required new money, it had to go to appropriations, and. Um, and so they didn't actually pass the bill. They just folded it into the budget. So the budget that you guys got quite finally had, had our entire child care program in it, including the, you know, the little line about you know, getting a waiver from, from uh, regulation if you've been in business for 10 years or you know, something like that. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the process. I do want to encourage you to, to, to follow the legislature. Um, you can go to Vermont.gov, and it's it's pretty it's it's a pretty user friendly website. You can see what's going on on the House and Senate floor. You can get um, a schedule. You can listen. Oh yes. Uh, yeah. Well, B that's BPR. You have to go to. BPR. Yeah, but you can do it through the. Uh, oh, through this. Okay, I haven't done that. Um, thank you. Um, uh, you can also look at the. the you, there's a. Um, if you look, you can see it says full weekly committee schedule, and so you can click on that, and it will give you every single committee in the building and what we're doing all week. Now, be clear that those are always subject to change. The, um, sometimes we run over on the floor and we don't get anything done in the afternoon. Um, sometimes witnesses get sick. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if there's something that you're following closely, you need to double check that, you know, like, like if you were going to come and watch, um, you need to double check that day to make sure it's really happening. Um, and, okay, so, so Dick talked about the, the budget adjustment. Um, so the, the governor gave his budget address last week, um, and now we start to drill down um, in our committees. On the House side, um, the, um, the, the Appropriations Committee is, is very deferential to the policy committees. So um, I... In the House. I, 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 I prefaced yeah. it with that. Oh, I didn't hear that part. I was just <laughs> focusing on the word yes, yes. On, on, on the House side. Um, that actually, <clears throat> it's actually better than it was even when you were in the House. It's I think. great. Um, I and um, so human services issues first come to our committee. Um, I mean, the appropriations has the budget, and they're hearing from all of those people. But they let us um, drill down. On, on things that affect um, uh, children, you know, the, uh, um, the child protection services uh, piece and the elder uh, services piece um, and um, public health in the health department. We, we have all of those are within our jurisdiction. So this week, we're going to be hearing from the commissioners of each of those departments um, for, you know, kind of the overview. We've already heard from the secretary of the AHS. Um, and then we divide, our committee divides into little sub, subgroups, and we, um, we go and have lunch with people from each of those uh, agencies and really drill down on, okay, you know, you're, you're adding, why do you want to add a position here, you know, why is the caseload lower here, and really try to get a feel for it. We also talk to the advocates who often have um, 
a different perspective on what the administration is proposing. And just to back up a little bit, Dick, Dick was talking about how we get we get the, we get the proposal from the governor, governor, but there's a prior step to that, which is what what the what the agencies and departments do. So all last fall. Um, all of these agencies that I'm talking about were sitting down and they were looking at what, what they think they need and they put together a pr proposal that then went to the governor's office and he said, well, you know what, guys? You want, you want $10 million and I only have eight, so we're going to cut something. And so, so the, the final decision on what the, what the proposal is comes from the governor's office. And so sometimes, sometimes when we have the administration and they will, <coughs> they will reveal that although they have to support the governor's budget, um, they could they could use a little more, and so we have to deal with that. And, and of course, you know, we we always pass a balanced budget, and we do it within the um, the revenue forecast that is agreed by the um, um, the legislative and administration economists. So so there's a number, and that, that we can't go over um, in in his committee, um, and. So we're, we're working within that. So if, if so, if we want, if there's something that my committee really wants, sometimes we have to figure out what we would cut to make that happen. And with that, I will turn over. Uh, I think I think Alice, I think the senators want to work. Go for it. Somebody's asking question. What should I go next, or you you feel free to flip a coin? Do it. Uh, oh, I, I meant. But, uh, are you taking questions no, right now? No, no. We're Just that we're presenting. Do your thing, and then we'll ask questions. Do now. your thing. Okay, um, I'm Alice Nitka, I'm in Ludlow, along with Dick and Allison. We represent all the towns in Windsor County, plus Londonderry in Wyndham County, and Mount Holly in Raleigh County. So, um, I'm on appropriations and judiciary. So, uh, well, let's see. Appropriations, so I'll just give you a little bit of what's going on so far. In appropriations, we've been working on the budget adjustment which is the true up of last year's budget, which goes through um, June 30th of this year, and what, where they've maybe overspent in some departments and where they haven't, haven't spent enough. I mean, they've spent under what they were given to spend, and so we threw the whole thing up. Sometimes there's additional money that needs to be put in. <coughs> of course, like the year of Irene, everything, everything in the state yeah. was uh, totally out of whack, so quite a few things had to be done. But that's, so we're, the House has already passed that, and we're probably going to vote on the budget adjustment this week. So we've also started working on the budget. And Dick, have you already spoken about the budget? I spoke more about the, uh, the adjustment. Oh, I just okay. mentioned that. Okay. I showed the cliff notes. Yeah? Oh, good. <laughs> so uh, maybe Dick mentioned it, maybe not the proposed spending for next year of general fund money, which is state money, no federal backup or anything, is proposed to be, I think, $1.5 And the overall budget for the state, including all the federal money that comes in, is proposed to be, I think, $8.2 billion. And that includes, that includes the Ed Fund, right? That's, yes. That includes, <laughs> that includes the, the education fund, in other words, the money we get from the federal government toward education, all the transportation money that comes from the federal government, which is for bridges, roads. I mean, there's frequently, in, on some of the roads, there's a 20% match, like 10 from the town, um, 10 from the state to the federal match. Depends what the project <laughs> is. Uh, the money for the National, you know, to get to where the money for the National Guard is running through us, money for the airports is running through us. Human services, of course, that's running through, when I say us, I mean the state of Vermont, and that's what we're doing in that 8.2. And that might not be the final number in the end, I'm just saying that's roughly where it is. So that's how, you know, you hear about a budget that's like that, it's like, eeks, you know, tons of zeros. But, um, so we're, we're starting to take testimony on that, and of course the House is already um, doing that. They started working on the budget in December. Your appropriations. Can well, be. okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, right. That's for sure. Um, so that's every single topic imaginable comes through the appropriations committee because most of them cost some money. So it, it all comes through us, and we look at it very, very carefully. I have to admit, down to the pennies almost. So 
it's, for instance, um, an item that came up um, last year for um, the poorest of poor people who are just surviving, say, on supplemental security. It's a division of social security, but it's not straight. It's for people who haven't worked enough quarters to be paid regular social security in their lifetimes. So they, they are getting, say they moved into a nursing home, and they have very little any money that they get on their own. And in a nursing home, um, generally speaking, you don't have money. You have to have some personal money, which is the personal needs allowance. And that they were getting, they hadn't had a raise in 10 years. Um, you know, they buy, like some people in a nursing home might be buying, um, you know, cards for somebody in the home's birthday. They might need a new nightgown. In many places you have to pay for your own haircuts. So it was very little money that they were living on every month. So we um, raised that. Do you remember what we gave them for a raise? Twenty-five dollars. That was my bill. <laughs> Measly. So they, you know, the, their their monthly personal needs allowance went up twenty-five dollars, which some people still didn't want to do. But it was, you know, when you see the money, when you see the size of this budget, and what we're spending on so many different things, um, it, it was a desperate need, really. And it was good you put that in. If, if I can just jump in for a minute, yes. that, that was my bill, and we did it in my committee, and everybody said, oh, we have to do this, and it passed out 11-0, and it went to appropriations, and it sat in appropriations. Um, they were house very, appropriations. They, they were, house appropriations, right. They were, they were very cordial when I went in, um, and they said, sounds good, and it just did not make the cut in the house. And um, so I was ecstatic that the Senate figured so it out. So we, we put that in, thinking, you know, hey, these, this is really a disgrace that I'm not helping these people with all this money that we're spending. So it's that kind of analysis of stuff that happens, even on all. So anyway, as I said, as someone said here, that we're working from the governor's budget that he puts together with his agencies, and then we go over that. And of course, certainly some things are changed. And that is because he writes this much earlier in the year, and needs and money spent, money not spent, things come up during that interim period from when it gets to us. The other thing, um, I'm on the Judiciary Committee, and in there the focus right now has been on justice reinvestment. In other words, the state has been working for quite a long time on trying to square away a lot of our, what some people see as injustice and what other people see as just the nature of some of the persons in the correctional system has changed, the crimes have changed, some of them are exactly are just as horrible as they were before, but they've ch it's changed. You know, with, with the, the drug problems around, things have really changed. So we're working on who needs to be in prison, who can be treated in the community, which you know, <coughs> provide, provide there are programs there for treatment, for um, keeping very close track of someone that, that might be a problem. Um, so we're looking at that whole thing. We're looking at we have a, a much fewer, we have fewer people in prison now than we did, mainly because, first of all, in my opinion, there are fewer crimes, crimes are going down, except in certain areas, but one of the things is, of course, as we see fewer children in school and have seen the numbers declining over the past 20 years at least, there are fewer, and I say young men, because mainly those are the, those are the people who are committing some of these crimes, and so there are fewer of them to commit the crimes. So we've been able to have fewer people in our prisons. And hopefully we're doing some stuff with rehabilitation as well. I think you're still retired from us. <laughs> I said, I think you're still retired from us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's, um, you know, it's a very different system. We used to have work camps. Uh, the work camp in Windsor, which is closed, the entire Windsor prison is closed now. There were not enough, um, there aren't enough people in prison who can be part of the work camp work group. There still is a St. Johnsbury prison, but even the numbers there on the work crew are down, mainly because those people who are able to be on a work crew and going into the community are able now to be supervised in the community, more so than they were before. So anyway, it's all, that's what's going on. A lot of other things in judiciary too, robocalls for example. Right. That, may, that may have been one of the bills that, if you've read the list in the Herald of Randolph, that's one of the bills you saw in there, uh, trying to do something about robocalls. Will that be successful? Who knows? So anyway, give answers to questions. 
Good morning. Thank you for continuing the tradition of the early Monday morning <laughs> breakfast meeting. Morning is not my best time. Alice and I would welcome you to have a conversation at 11 at night at the end of the lounge. <laughs> Burning a candle at both ends is a challenge. Uh, anyway, I'm Allison Clarkson. I live in Woodstock and happily join these three colleagues uh, working on behalf of Windsor County and two extra towns uh, in the legislature. Uh, we, uh, I serve uh, as vice chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs in the morning and in the afternoon serve uh, on government operations. And we are off to uh, an incredible start. I have never served on two conference committees in January, which, you know, conference committees are the House passes bills, the Senate passes bills, and if we don't agree, we true it up and come to compromise, we hope, in conference committees. And they're usually at the end of session uh, in uh, April and May, and this year, because we had not finished our work on minimum wage or paid family leave, uh, I found myself on two conference committees in January, which is very unusual. Um, the issues that, you know, you've read probably, all of you who are in this room are clearly engaged enough to know what's going on and be reading uh, the Valley News and the Herald, um, so you probably know the big issues. But in Senate Economic Development, we're dealing with uh, housing we're going to be doing. We're really trying to crack the nut of uh, helping uh, spur the additional housing needs. We have desperately large housing needs in the state and uh, particularly workforce development housing. Not necessarily Section 8, which people think of as affordable housing, which isn't. That's, that's uh, uh, seriously super low income housing, but, but really hardcore our teachers, our, our police people, are the people who work in our towns. We want to live in our towns, and we need to uh, enable housing in more communities and all over. So housing is continues to be a big nut we cr uh, need to crack. Uh, student debt we're addressing. Uh, re recruitment to Vermont, as you know, you've heard we have a huge demographic challenge. Only 65% of us are working, uh, and that number is slated to go down. Uh, more people are retiring. Uh, people are, are, are coming back, but we need to recruit more people. Uh, and we're coming up, as you've heard, uh, with all sorts of ideas on how to do that. And of course, uh, our, our, our big and constructive challenge, and one that, that's very interesting is, is, is working on our workforce development and how, how can we come up with some additional opportunities, a lot of opportunities for people who don't necessarily want to go on to four-year college when we also see this spiraling student debt, which is such a barrier for so many people. Student debt is the number one reason young professionals don't come back to rural states. It's a common rural state problem all over America because they can earn more in cities uh, to pay down this huge monkey on their back. And uh, so that is that we really want to address that in substantive ways uh, this, semest this semester. It is sort of like a semester. Anyway, this session. And in uh, and you know there are other things we're working on also in economic development, but those are I would say the the four key big areas. Uh, and in uh, government operations, we're working on unclaimed property, uh, which is a huge issue and is being uh, we're re re rewriting that whole chapter and do and addressing that. Big issue is public records access to public records, um, sort of like elections. It's sort of the cost of government doing business. And it's a, it's a big issue uh, because there are uh, barriers to, uh, to access, particularly for the press, but for the public who want to know what's going on. And uh, so we're trying to create, uh, to shine more light on that and figure out how we're going to, uh, what we're going to recommend. We need to, uh, we're working hard on coming up with an emergency medical services a solution, a solution to the loss of our EMS services, the loss of volunteers, how can, there's particular issues with it as opposed to fire and police, and we're, we're working on that with a big, with a big bill. Um, we have the Ethics Commission, which we have created, but is sort of toothless, and we're trying to figure out how to make it uh, 
give it at least some good molars. Um, and we have the, the uh, Montpelier charter change has prompted a, a fairly robust conversation in the state house about non-citizen voting. Um, the uh, non-citizens, green card holders, many of them married to all of us uh, who want to have uh, say where they live. Many other countries allow this uh, and um, would like to be able to vote simply in municipal elections. And then the state, uh, the state created towns and, and municipal governments, and we control how towns and municipal governments uh, uh, the, the rules of towns and, and, and municipal governments, and so it has come to us to, to to make a decision about whether we're going to allow municipalities to allow non-citizens to vote simply in those elections on issues that affect the taxes they're paying. You know, so they, you know, it's it's a little tax without representation in, in large measure. Uh, this isn't a large number of people, but it, it's going to be a, a fairly robust con conversation. People feel strongly about it, and you learn astonishing things about people's backgrounds and who is married to whom and who came from where and how long they've been here and how strongly they feel about this issue. Um, I just want to say, uh, Alice and Sandy touched briefly on vulner vulnerable adults, and I have just moved by 94-year-old mother from Buffalo, New York to Woodstock, Vermont. And I, I have to say that I really am so grateful for the work your committee in particular, Sandy, has done on, on vulnerable adults and our aging population. You know, I, you don't think about those issues as much as we ought to until we have to deal with them. And the, the number of scam calls <laughs> my mother would get. Anyway, I am being very appreciative of that work in, in particular right now. So, um, yeah, it's interesting at 64 to find your mother at 94 still fairly active, you know, very active and engaged. I talked to Little Women this weekend. <laughs> and they, she loved it. It was her first film in 1933, that Katherine Hepburn film came out. It was her first, she was eight. And she was so excited to see it again. Anyway, so that's it from my end, and we're yours. We're open for questions. Can I sir? Mr. Moderator, or? Don't fight, don't fight. I'm, 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 no. <laughs> Go ahead. I've heard every one of you, and everything you said is fine, no. One thing I didn't hear at all is dealing with those unfortunate illegals or refugees, or whatever you want to call it. We are talking about we have a housing shortage, and here we are, many cities and towns are proposing to bring more in. Where are these people going to go? Where are they going to stay? Who's going to support them? Who's going to pay their medical care? How do you see this? And remember, remember one thing, I'm one of them, OK? I came here with $20, and that was it. But back those years, in order to come in as a legal immigrant, you have to have somebody here in this country to guarantee you a job and also a place to stay. So. How do you feel on that? And then the other thing is about the Social Security, paying taxes on our Social Security. Change, when are we going to get out of that? We changed part of that last year. Um, okay. What's the um, income is thirty is sixty thousand dollars or less. Social Security, you do not pay taxes. On. Okay. State tax. That State, I didn't know. State tax. State tax. That I didn't know, and, and I appreciate and that. And there yeah. is a there is a proposal by the governor to increase that beyond sixty thousand. I don't know whether that would pass or not, but that's the governor has proposed that. But we, you know, listen to the people. We yeah. Wanted to get people more money, so that passed. Wait, let me just finish his. And the other thing. Oh, wait, listen, wait, before you go there. Yeah. So what was your first yeah. refugee? A legal immigrant. Oh, yes, yes. Well, so here we know what's going on now. When they come. Um, churches are frequently sponsoring the families that come. There are an abundance of available jobs for people right now. There are too few workers in our state right now. People can't get employees. A couple of places have closed because they couldn't get employees. Especially so, entry level. Yeah, and True. Is, so so there are. I mean, the <coughs> many of the persons who are coming are high-level, um, educated people. So you know, I, I know one woman. She she's working as a manicurist, but she's an engineer. So she's mm -hmm. you know that's an entry-level job that she's in while she gets everything <coughs> squared away. Her license for you know professional engineer and those kinds of things. So 
Right, and housing. You mentioned that lots of times churches are arranging that in families that they, you know, I know a woman who's a member of the legislature in Rutland, she's in the Senate, she has, she has helped host two families, got them all started, the church is supporting them, so that, that's what's going on there. And at what point, that, you know, they become a burden to the state? They, if they, ever. they may in the very entry time, but they are, they are going to work and their health insurance is frequently coming through employment or they're paying it on their own. I mean, a lot of them, they're going well, to work. I don't work. think we have a choice. I mean, we, we, we are in dire straits here. I mean, Dick touched on it with Village. My business, I've been there for 36 years, and my wife and I are contemplating our, our, our reduced hours. Yeah. We're running from six oh, to yeah. six. We're desperate for what you know, we're, we're an agent for the state liquor store, and I'm like, you know, they're going to have to deal with those perimeters because we can't staff the building. Yeah, so I think we have, I, I mean, I, yeah. I don't like to take a cynical view. I think those people are coming to yeah. what we used to have as a land of opportunity, mm -hmm. like it was with UNET. My yeah. son-in-law, they came from the Czech Republic in 86 with 81 bucks, and his father made it good in America, in uh, Boston, his wife, I'm and they made it, and that. they're contributing to society, but we can't. We can't shut it. We, we're, we're, we're what, four, uh, my, my wife's out at BTC, thir I mean, worked at BTC 37 years. The Vermont Pension Fund is $4 billion in the rear, IOUs, that we're underfunded. Mm -hmm. And when we sit here and talk about surplus money, we got a little extra to stay, steal from Peter to pay Paul. That's a significant, for an $8.2 billion budget, you got that big matzo ball standing out there. In my business, we're done. Mm -hmm. Shut the doors. But at the same time, I'm seeing, you know, I, I definitely with Dick, sorry to touch on this, but I met a kid the other day from Norwich, 26 years old, nice, clean cut kid at FWM. And my buddy who works there for 20 years said, I want you to meet this kid. So he can't wait. He's moving to Durango, Colorado. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the hill that he's asked to climb here in Vermont is he's like, Mount, the hill he's climbing in Vermont is like Mount Everest. I mean, between paying taxes on these homes and living here or whatever. And he has a fairly good job. And I'm sitting there thinking, we cannot <clears throat> lose these kids. Right. These are the ones we can't lose, and I see it every day. So well, I mean, the same thing with my son, Peter. He sold everything he got here, went to Massachusetts. Everything is better. Now begins to see that Texas or Arizona, it's a lot better than even Massachusetts. Oh, way better. And he's pushing me to move. And I would do it just like that, except Heidi is in the way, and I, she's not in my way. But it would be like a death penalty to take her out of the house and go somewhere else. But how long can we keep going like this, taxing ourselves to death right. to satisfy 15, 20 people that they really need help? And what about the rest? Yeah, no, I did. Well, that's where we're losing young people with taxes. Can yeah. I go back to your uh, question, mm -hmm. which is uh, the, the federal government sadly controls the spigot in terms of sending us uh, people, refugees, uh, uh, asylum seekers, and legal immigrants. We, des we want them. Our arms are open. The governor said in his state of the state and in the budget he reinforced we want those workers. We have 10,000 jobs at the moment, it's estimated, that we could fill tomorrow. And so it's not for lack of jobs. Housing is a bitter, bigger challenge. We have very low um, non-occupancy rates. I mean, our housing is full. Uh, the challenge we face is uh, improving the quality of our old homes uh, and uh, relaxing some of our permitting and regulations in our downtown areas where we want uh, uh, housing, we want a uh, strong community. So we're working on that, and you will see big changes this year in some of that. But the spigot in terms of welcoming people, we want people. Our arms are open. If they want to work, we want them here. And uh, the refugee resettlement community in Burlington is working hard. Uh, they do a great job. And uh, our communities' arms are all open in some communities, particularly our bigger cities and towns are, are organized well to, to, to bring people, um, but it's, it's, it's sad that we don't control the spigot. I'd like to believe that okay. everything you said right now is fine and dandy and all, but I'm afraid it will come to the point that Burlington and the churches, their baskets going to run dry. And then, what do we do with these people? That's the state. We have very generous people in this state who have helped this 
So if you're finished, this I'm done. You had what you had um, your hand up next. Back to I'm I'm Scott Putney. I'm working at the local school. Um, basically, we're short-handed because of six, so I got to get to work. But I'd like to uh, address. I've been going to school board meetings. This this the. Uh, Bethel South Royal, yeah. and we should invite right. uh, Mr. O'Brien, being as our schools are so tied and they're our biggest expense. Yeah. Um, but um, mm -hmm. the the school boards are trying to balance, and, uh, to project, get ready, negotiate with teachers. Yeah. And every time I go to a school meeting, they say that um, the state hasn't given us our numbers for reimbursement for special ed and um, food services. How are we going to? How are we going to make a budget? How can we negotiate with our teachers and and come up with a reasonable budget? And it seems to me that 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 um, there should be a timeline where the state is. <coughs> they don't have whether it's they don't have enough people. The, the the districts aren't sending them correct numbers, and it takes a long time to sort it out. I don't know what the reasons are, but it's impossible to make a budget without having these numbers. And as you've read in the paper, Bethel South Royalton are talking about um, $250,000. They're down to $250,000. They're up to they're close to yeah. a half a million. Now they've kind of sorted things out. I realize a lot of it is local problems with our supervisory yeah. union. But again, they still don't have the numbers from, from special ed and food. Yeah. I happen That's to be working in a lunch, lunch okay. thing trying to sort out. They say we right. we we're a hundred thousand dollars out of whack, um, and they can't, they so can't none verify of us, the numbers. None of us sit on education, yeah. um, so I don't, I don't know that we immediately know the answer to that. But I think we should be following up. The, the uh, AOE Agency of Education is down a huge number of people, and those are both federally funded programs. Just, well, and that, so there may be some the play going is, on with the feds. I just don't know. But if, yeah. at the ground level, we're right. trying to feed kids. We're feeding, we're no, feeding I, I breakfast, yeah. snack, lunch. You'd think they could get from breakfast to lunch without having to be fed in between. But in any case, and dinner, all these things and are state too. and federal funded and yeah. take a lot of paperwork. I get that. But somehow this needs to get, yeah. somebody's so, got to push that along. Yeah. Okay. And, um, they go to the state and, well, we haven't got to it. We're shorthanded, whatever it is. You guys need to yep. pay more, whatever you got to do, because um, it's physically impossible. Yes. Senators, uh, after the state of the state address, it seemed that the governor had the disconnect between migration into the state the issue of climate change and tourism. Today you haven't mentioned climate change. Climate change, you may not be aware of it, but people are moving to Vermont because of climate change. Why aren't you talking about it? That is the key. We're waiting for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but that's the key to the school problems, all our problems relate to the fact that we need to prepare ourselves for a new wave of immigration into our state, which will be more than just people coming to our country, but people from our country. I heard that Texas is a great place to go, but after people have been flooded three times in the Houston area, they start going, well, you know, that little sweet spot, Vermont, Unfortunately, unfortunately, Vermont is a sweet spot in the climate crisis issue. And I just don't see our legislators being real today with what we're doing. The young people are. Why aren't we bringing this subject right to the forefront and say, come to Vermont and start bunking down and start growing food and start doing what it's going to take because as the rest of the country has agricultural problems, I guess there'll be more stress on us to start producing food again. You're absolutely right. Uh, they are. There are climate refugees here. I, uh, there are three of us who are members of the Climate Solutions Caucus. Some of the biggest climate bills are being worked on right now. The Global Warming Solutions Act is almost ready for prime time in the House. It will start in the House, then comes to the Senate. 
uh, we were some of us are the sponsors of it in both the House and the Senate. So we're all we're we're very aware. I think uh, I think what Vermonters uh, have forgotten in many ways is that four of our most iconic Vermont industries are under total threat with climate change. Agriculture, you mentioned, but outdoor <coughs> recreation, our forest products industries, and tourism all will evaporate within 50 years if we don't stem uh, the. Uh, if we don't reduce climate change. It is the biggest issue which is af affects us in all oh. all our work on resiliency. Right. And and we have to take outside the box. You talked about uh, the issues around forestry. Right now, after Australia has been burning and the Amazon politically got burned, right now the current federal administration has given the go-ahead to cut our Green Mountains. And it's underway right now but Vermont isn't paying attention. Well, we are paying attention. Well, why don't you push the stop button? Just say, let's hold off for a minute, because just maybe capturing CO2 happens to re uh, relate to the trees. There, there, this summer, there was a whole uh, study group on exactly that issue, but, on forest right. sequestration. They, there's a lot of work actually going on on this subject. The young people Look want, at some of the bills that have been Young introduced. people don't want studies anymore. So young people the, want the governor to wait. say, stop for a moment. And so they have to like One them. of the things that uh, went on last year, what, there were a lot of things with regard to climate change that were in different bills, not standing out there that people were noticing so much. An increase in the number of charging stations around, there was quite a bit of money put into that. An increase in money for electric buses where that's appropriate. Um, you know, there, Quite a few things, more awards, I think, for um, you know energy efficient appliances. There are a lot of things kind of spread all over the map to help people. <coughs> and it's to 40 reduce. years late. Yeah, well, but you, you, you have to start, start sometime. You oh, no, no. Start. But I, I mean, you, I've yeah. been here long enough to know it's 40 years but late. But in reality, we're in a very rural state. Where did you get here this morning? How did you get here? Did you ride the subway? <laughs> no, you drove a car. If you want to go to Montague, we haven't got yeah, those yeah, right. things. And until energy gets so expensive, and I'm not an advocate of it, but until it gets to be eight bucks it, it, to go to Montpelier, I'll call up Dick and say, hey, you going up? I'll ride with you. And that will happen when the economic right. thing drives but it up. But the expense is a hidden expense. We are experiencing right. the hidden, hidden expense right. by going bankrupt right now. So um, several years ago, actually, uh, uh, we passed um, an anti-idling law. It has quite a few exceptions, like for school buses and stuff. But it doesn't get enforced, and people don't know about it. Um, and I did a little bit of research on this. You don't ever need to idle your vehicle. You don't even have to warm it up. The modern cars don't need to be warmed up. And I go by the, um, the local, um, uh, the local um, uh, mini, mini mart, um, and you know, there's three trucks outside uh, with the motors running, and, and people are inside schmoozing over coffee. So, you know, part of what we need to do is, is wake up and educate ourselves and educate our neighbors. Yeah. And, and we are, uh, as you probably have read, the, the governor and this, our state is very involved with 17 other states in the Transportation Climate Initiative, which will be a little like our regional, uh, the Reggie bill was for electricity. Uh, and we are waiting to see that is still being negotiated. We've signed on to the draft to, to you know punt it into the next phase. We're hoping that we'll have a TCI agreement by the end of this session, which would be great. And that you will probably see in 17 states an embedded carbon charge, which is of course uh, Governor Scott's chal challenge. But also it is there's in some ways safety numbers it, with all 17 of us doing it together. Those, uh, when, when that gets enacted, those prices will be, that increase in cost will be embedded whether we sign on or not. Because it, as you know, fuel is re distributed regionally and that will, that will inevitably affect us. It's but it's going to adversely it's affect already. the lowest people on the economic yeah. chain, which is where we're at. I mean, and that's where <coughs> part of the that's thing what they're working you on. have to recognize with our young people here, starting down there, those that, and when you, you, you know, North Carolina, Every, these people for energy and cost of taxes, you know, the numbers are not even comparable. And I even found it with real estate in Maine that their taxes for a house are quite a bit less than ours. So right. it's, it's, but you're not going to keep a young person here when, when he gets to the end of the week and he's worked all week and, he, and there's nothing left. 
the, but we, just to finish on the climate thing, the two biggest areas we use energy on, as we know, are our houses and our cars and our and our vehicles. Right. And so we're working really hard on the vehicle front. The houses, we're also looking to expanding efficiency uh, efficiency Vermont into an all fuels and weatherization. Uh, and weatherization. So we we are pushing and investing in oh, doing no. exactly that. And uh, I anyway. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. Finish your thought. No, I don't. We gotta get some other. Yeah, Allison. Allison, real quick. I'm curious why the House and the Senate haven't put Phil Scott into an electric car because he is the model individual that is inspiring young people at Thunder Road to race fossil fuel with our governor in an electric car. These are the small steps that I expect you guys yeah. to do. I gotta say, it, people need I some got, little bit of entertainment too, don't they? Right, drag yeah. racing, electric cars. <laughs> <right. laughs> no, I, I, I gotta tell you, every morning, every morning I arrive at the state house, and there is a big gas guzzling SUV in the governor's parking place, and that would be so easy to address, and it would be, I mean, it, it's with the stroke of a pen. Not even, just a phone call. The governor could say, send me a, a fuel efficient car. I'm tired of dri driving around the state. In, in, in so gas Wednesday gas. morning, yeah. we need to ask okay. him to do that. But I, 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 want, I want to say something. <clears throat> I, uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. The problem with, with this is that I, I can tell you, speaking for myself, for 30 years, and now it is 30 years, I have been uh, denounced by colleagues as an alarmist, as a green sneakers. John McClory referred to me as one of the high priests of the global warming religion. Okay, And now I'm getting scolded by young climate activists. Okay, Vermont, for example, invests, our, our pension funds are invested in fossil fuels. And they shouldn't be. And there's a movement now to get us out of that. But what I'm getting is letters addressed to me by name. You are investing in, in, in fossil fuels. And as your constituent, I demand that you stop it. And, then now I, and I've been trying to figure out a polite way to say, <laughs> who, who, the, who do you think you're talking to? And what I just say is, I, I think your scolding is misdirected. But you're right. So part, part of that is, is some of that, and I'm not saying that the anger needs to calm down. Young people have every reason to be angry. You do want to focus, you want to know who you're talking to, okay? But the other thing is, I think the, the discussion has shifted, the color of the discussion has shifted. We have gone from outright, I think people who deny, who are still denying the science on global warming are really in the foil hat. Range now, they're, they're area, it's Area 51 stuff. It's it's nutcase stuff, all right. The science we know that man-made global warming is real. We know it's terrible. That is settled. But what we have now is what I call denial light, and we all know this. We all have a friend who you know is drinking too much, who says, no, 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 it's true, I, I admit it, I, I did drink too much, but I'm not an alcoholic. I, I've never missed a day's work. I've never raised my hands in my life. Yeah, I, I got I got a handle on it. Denial light. What we have now is we hear people saying, yes, it's a problem, we've got to address it, but you've got to be reasonable. Well, yeah, that's what Jimmy Carter said 30, 40 years ago. And he was right. Then. And he predicted. He said, we can start now, we can do it painlessly, we can do it gradually, or we can wait, and in 30 years we'll have a crisis. Well, it's 40 years later, and we have a crisis. And, uh, it's global, though. What's that? It's global. It's not yeah. Global. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. But I mean, we all need to do our well, I agree, so. but I mean, India and China are alone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a planet problem. So no. Far, far <laughs> <in that area. laughs> we have control over what we do. Yeah. So, Dick, so just let's, let me just go to the pension issue for a moment. We are getting all kinds of letters. They're all canned letters came from mm -hmm. about the same source. But one of the things, two years ago, I spoke with Beth Pierce about the pension fund and where they're invested. And we have Vermont at that point, there are three pension funds with people's money in them. I don't call it our money. There's the municipal employees pension fund, the state employees pension fund, and the teachers pension fund, the three of them. And at that point, when I spoke with her, none of them, she had not, her office had not invested, and had any investments in fossil fuels with regard to single investments. 
And, but she did say that of some of the, um, you know, the big mutual, mutual funds, those what's invested in those change from time to time. So there might be some in there periodically. And the other thing was, and, and I don't know what the situation is right now. I'll have to a note to myself to talk to Beth. But um, the other thing is, of course, some of the pension funds have a, like a green pension fund whereby the person who's putting the money into the pension fund can put it into funds that have no um, fossil fuels in them. So there are some options for people yeah, there who are, are the investors in them. There's some plenty. So high anyway, what, what else? How about somebody else? You look like you had a whole list there. Yeah, I got a lot of yeah, stuff. I have a lot to ask you, but I don't have time. Okay. Uh, number one, this on this, the climate change the bill here, on yeah. this hill said you proposed to raise it from 5 to 9 to maybe 17 cents a gallon. That's the, on the transportation, transportation climate initiative? The, yeah. Uh, How can people afford this? They've got an old car, and it, to go get it inspected, it's $500 or $1,000 a year because you people made them do it. I see now they change it. You don't have to have a light inside of your car now. That There's a lot they, of things they've taken that off. They've, we yeah. changed it a lot. Yeah, of you need to change it a lot. It's just safety issues, not yeah. not the light on your license plate. There was a whole big thing, and DMV rewrote the. But these people can't afford it. Can't afford the light on the tail light. No, no, no. To, tail light. To, to, to be, have their car. Oh, you mean to? And they can't afford new cars. I absolutely agree with. Larry that. and I work at the food shelf. He does. He and his wife do a lot. They go gala stuff, yeah. and Thursday nights we go down and bag. Yeah. These people can't afford. You ought to see that. How many? How many did they have last week? We had a record. We had 50 people come, which represented yeah. about 125 people. Wow. People yeah. giving food in one in one day. One and day. Two hours yeah. at noon and two hours at night. Four hours wow. total. Yeah. Where's the food shop? In, in Royalton, South Royalton. Yeah. So what is it going to be a year from now? Well, this hasn't passed at this point. Or it, it, it's also it's phased in, and it will begin. Yeah. Uh, right now, our gas prices fluctuate fairly substantially, um, and we absorb it and say nothing when it goes from 220s, which it was this summer, now to 254 in Woodstock. So More we already longer. we already experience it. It will not be jackhammered like that. It will begin. <laughs> If, if Vermont joins the uh, Transportation Climate Initiative, it will begin at something like uh, four or five cents embedded in and gradually over several years like go cancer. It's like yeah. cancer. Yeah. Uh, well, it's actually probably, it's probably paying, you know, if you've lived in Europe, you pay triple that amount. And people are far more thoughtful about how they use their fuel. We need to be far more thoughtful about how we use our fuel. We already know that. I mean, so it's it's... We, and, and one of the sticking points on the TCI is exactly the, the justice, the social and uh, uh, financial justice that, we're tr that they're trying to work out so that it will be fair for all people. I mean, there's no question it's a bigger challenge on rural poor. What are they going to do with the money? Hmm? What will they do with the money? This, this there, it's all going to be reinvested in so uh, resiliency and climate issues. Is that going to lower the climate change by one degree? It will help where, where will it go lower to? it in significant ways. But where will it go to? Carbon I, I, I can't answer that. I'm no, not energy efficient. It, it's just like it'll all go into energy up in, efficiency. Up in Lowell with the windmills. What does that tax the credit go for that? In, into our electric. It goes to Massachusetts. Or Connecticut. We have to look at them, and I'm not opposed to them either. But the credit went to Massachusetts. These solar panels they put up in nice fields that we were farming. They're solar panels now. Right, and that's often a community solar. In many of yeah. those communities where you see that, that is helping uh, provide electricity for our downtowns and our communities. But what is the payback? I do have the biggest. It's fairly significant. Uh, People solar, are very happy with them. I do have the biggest solar display in the state, right up the road from me. And and um, what happened with our utilities? They want they were they were supposed to sell you know. Green Mountain Power is going to be forced to buy it at a rate much higher than what they've been buying power at. And they're, of course, doing those you know, batteries and all this stuff. So they refused, they filed uh, something with the Public Utilities Board to not buy it, not be forced to buy it. And so in the end, the company gave up. It was, it's been purchased by two people, two big groups since, and now it is going directly to Massachusetts. And the thing that was 
our town did get some benefits from it, not with regard to energy or anything. But there is an awful lot of that going on. Or they put them in mass shootings. But, but what is going on <laughs> is, well, because they could get them in Vermont. Easier, easier. probably. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the other thing is there are many municipalities have put in, yes. many have put in their own solar displays. Um, and they are paying all the bills yeah. for their town hall. And they're very successful. And we're paying more over. per kilowatt hour. No. No, no you're not. Really? We're the we're town no, the town, the town budgets went down when the town puts it in itself and gets the benefit. They've been able to reduce the cost in town of their energy bills. Like if there's, some of them have them going to the schools, some of them have all the town, you know, the town offices. There, so there is that going on. Which is does really Bethel have an energy committee? Yes, yes. So it does. So it must be exploring community. So we, we Bethel that. does have an energy committee, and I'm on it. And oh, yes, we have we have credit for our street lights, and we pay pretty near nothing yeah. for yeah. our street lights because of our investment in, yeah. in uh, solar panels. So that piece is working. This, yeah, there's yeah. a fellow. There's a fellow over here that is handling. Going back to, to what uh, Ted Kenyon had to say. Um, I used to food shop a lot mm -hmm. here in Bethel. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing for me to eat here in Bethel and nobody wants to go all the way up to Berlin to go to the food shop to get the food, I've got to go down to Hartford or White River to get what I can get for myself. By the time that the day is done, yeah. I'm paying my respite worker for me the gas money to go in. I'm not getting anywhere. I've spent more time on gas than I have on food. That's, just my, that, that's just my input. We do need better mass transit. Thank you. We don't have that. Thank you. We only have public. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Going back to the transportation part here. Thanks, Scott. See? Sorry, I can't that's stay. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for looking at Thank you for that heads up. Welcome to the school. And yeah. Yeah. Special ed fund. Going back to the transportation part, there are so much opportunity. For an example, the town of Bethel with railroad tracks, the state can be contracting with Nissan to have an assembly plant for a special design electric car that works for Vermonters. I'm not talking about the car that has all the bells and whistles. I'm talking about the extra car to be able to go down to the grocery store to get a six pack of beer instead of using the truck. Now this car can be low geared, 35 miles an hour, electric, assembled right here in Bethel. What is going on? Why don't we have a, an assembly plant that's using components to put together and so that, that the state of Vermont can offer a low interest loan to Vermonters to get started in electric vehicles. Which, this is our transportation problem. This is a, creates jobs. What's going on? Why can't we motivate and think outside the box and solve these problems? Have you talked to your select board? My select board? About that issue? I'm not in Bethel. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, well, I think Bethel's the correct town for that particular project well, because of the railroad track. Your town is not particularly uh, anxious for economic development. They need to think about climate change and not tourism. Uh, so, you, know, you touched something with me because I've been involved in economic development for its accounting for 10, 12 years. And we have the, one of the biggest industrial vacant industrial buildings sitting down here with 12, 14 workers still working for casting. Nobody has made any effort to go out even contacting the uh, uh, economic development, development department in the state or, or the region to look for a new tenant. And I don't do it anymore, but I had one lined up, uh, an excellent tenant, a manufacturer of horse trailers. Uh, perfectly good. I, I couldn't get the select board to listen to me. I couldn't get any one of our last 37 town managers to even think of that as a, as a problem. But it's a, it's a big problem because you know what happens to those kind of buildings? They become vacant. And their tax assessment goes from $8 million to $2 million. And that, that building needs to be occupied, but 
I don't know if anybody in Bethel is thinking about it. Have you been in touch with Bob Haynes of the Green Mountain Economic Development? I've been on the board. Yeah, yeah, I loved your work. <laughs> so what's Bob, what's, what, is, what are they he's, working He's on? pretty busy in Randolph. <laughs> Why would they want to come to Vermont? It's not a business. You've got two issues there. One there, is there you can't get employees, and two is Act 250. Once you exactly. get those two things fixed, then I agree with this gentleman to have him. It's already permanent. Car. This is a space that's already permanent. Right, but you've got to change the use. You've got to change the use. That's a very he went important. through this, and I've been through it. Tell them about your business in Hartford. Oh. Yeah, don't don't, don't give me stuff on that. Because no, no, I, no, I, well, as you know, Act 250 is being to to totally rewritten and updated. So we will uh, hopefully have a bill that we can discuss in the next couple of months in terms of what's being proposed because the House is poised with that bill to uh, have something for us to talk about. But I know that we're looking at serious restrict, uh, uh, reductions and streamlining in downtown and village centers so that we can be promoting the kind of growth that we want uh, and relaxing a lot. And so that those structures that uh, Neil's talking about would fit uh, right into that. I understand what you're trying to say, but in many cases, like in the town of Royalton, and probably here in Bethel, to do things in the town itself, in the village, there's just no place to do it unless you tear down a bunch of stuff to build new buildings. Right. Because just, we just got mountains, we got rivers, we got railroads. You're, you're really... You're, you're hemmed in sometimes. You're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things we're looking at expanding is uh, the... We have designated downtowns, as you know, village yeah. centers. We're looking at expanding that to designated neighborhoods, what we're calling neighborhood designated mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. And that would expand it, precisely what you're talking about, which is... It's basically the next ring around that we all think of as downtown, even though it's not technically in the little prescribed I've area. I've been on the select board for 15 years. I stepped down this last March, but we did expand our village area some to incorporate a few things. Right. But it, it, it works, but I mean, we just have the constraints of the village and the yeah. hills and rivers and stuff. And so to help to get it outside of the different areas, you know, like you came more to the Mont Cassie's place and some of the other places where they put up your solar panels that don't give much to anybody. Well, <coughs> well and actually, that's, that's, I'd love to, I mean, I wish any of us were experts on that, but actually they are, that, that isn't, I don't think, a fair thing to say. I think that many of our solar panels are really helping uh, considerably, and um, I, I think that's a conversation once we have all the, those facts. I think I don't think you're correct on that. I and think there is some sort well, of there's some there's state, some advantage to it. The town world that gets some that. money from from the electricity, the school, the municipalities. Yeah. Like, I don't disagree there. But to have the tax credits go another state, I have a hard time not right. But but yeah. but the good news is that um, that we actually have reduced our statewide use of electricity because of all of the solar that that so so when they when when you see all of the charts that show you know what are, what are our numbers on global warming and and um, uh, greenhouse gases on electricity we, we, have, we have we have we have we have turned the curve we have turned the, the corner um, what's what's going to change is that now we are using electricity to um, uh, substitute for other fuels. For example, if you have a heat pump in your house to do shoulder season, you know, fall and spring and fall, you probably use less oil. So and 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 so now we're talking about instead of having just the electric efficiency, having an all fuels efficiency so that we look at all of our fuels. Uh, electric cars, the same thing. If you if you have a plug-in car, then you're taking you're taking power from the grid and you're not going to the gas station. But so it's 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 shifting it. Um, so we're going to start using more electricity and less of some of the other things if we, if, as we're moving forward. So in other words, use more electricity and pay more for us who use the electricity. No. I mean, I've noticed my bill the last three months, it's gone up of $50 a month more than... Yeah, mean mine did. Jordan. Now, why? <laughs> the same two people live in the house have, or we live in the yes, same way? Do you have winter rates? I think I don't the, give a damn what the rate is a rate. The know. rates change though by the season. Yeah. But fifty dollars a month, thirty dollars a month, forty dollars a month. And then they tell you um, what power company are you on? Which one do you think? 
Green Mountain Power. Of course. <laughs> Is there anything else? Yes. Well, yeah, there are a lot of municipal. There are lots, yeah. there are lots of municipal <coughs> electric companies. Yeah. Which Which is cheap. David had a question. Okay. We don't have time to get where. I need, I, need, I need several minutes because this whole electric thing, you guys are not even talking about the problem with electricity. How do you make solar panels? You use fossil fuels. Right. How do you make windmills? You use fossil fuels. How do you generate, uh, oh my God, I just put in a charger for a guy down in New Hampshire. His electric bill went from $50 a month to over $400 a month to be able to drive his electric car. Savings there? None. Not. Electric solar, solar panels, the people who install them, the de developers, Here's where all your money's That's going. Absolutely. Because they put them in there and they refuse to refuse to acknowledge there's to toxic materials in those panels. You get a 25 year warranty. They're no good in 25 years. Okay? They'll give them to you. Once you pay, once you pay for that, they're yours. So you have to dispose of them. You have to replace them. Solar panels are not the end all. Why are we not on the river? Why are we not? doing John Derpy's thing uh, yeah. more often. We have, we have these places. Is it for a fish? Yeah. Fish, fish. Okay. Well, I mean, I really, really think that people are missing the boat. Electricity, I agree with electricity. But what we're not talking about is how we get this electricity. Yeah. I think it's really just confusing for people to think that advocates of, of cleaner energy are ignorant or even more than ignorant, hiding the environmental downside of these technologies. That's absolutely part of the equation. There are always trade-offs for any, any environmental effort. That, that, that it's not a 100%, it's a 100% gain minus whatever uh, is, is, is the environmental loss. That, there's, everyone, everyone knows there are toxins involved. In I don't care anybody panels. talking no about it, it, so that we have something to talk about. That maybe we don't want to do this this way. I've been holding my hand up for 10 minutes, and Neil Fox refuses to wow. call on me. Everybody's mm -hmm. interrupting everybody else. I just wanted to say that one of the underappreciated and rarely mentioned benefits of solar panels and windmills is the distributed generation of electricity that results in more resilience in the entire system and the, the less dependence on the grid when it goes down. And nobody ever mentions that. That, should, that alone, even with higher costs and more toxins and everything, should attract us to a source of energy which is more local. I, I would agree with you until we start talking about the grid going down. The tree fell on the line back here in this last one. We were out power for four days. We got, I can almost see solar panel fields from my house. If there was a few trees cut, I could. I still have no electricity, because it still has to be dis distributed. I don't care if it's being, it's right over there. If the power line from there to here is down, that solar field is of no use. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to get too off the track. That's not. I'm just. I don't think it's a magic hour, so uh, anyone has a last question. I, I, when you people drive home at night in the legislature, I want you to think what did I do to improve the quality so that old people can live in Vermont? Am I lowering it so they can afford to live here? Are we going to put more expenses on them so they got to move? My son has moved to Tennessee with his wife. Now their daughter's down there with her husband. Uh, another one of my granddaughters with her husband and two kids. And they're not coming back. They're not coming back. Dad, I can't afford to live in one. Pretty impressive. No, Pretty David impressive. scares one. I'm, I'm thinking of that too. And I know a couple of other people are thinking the same way. My answer to that is reduce the damn taxes that you're putting on every time. Real estate taxes, electricity taxes, taxes for this, taxes for the shoes, taxes for the table. 
Can you live without taxes? I mean, how can we live with all that stuff? Well, I just would remind us we're a small state with a small number of people with a big heart. And uh, actually, the minute we touch anybody, the, any program that people benefit from, they are up in arms. So, it, you know, I think actually all of us feel pretty good that we're trying to, and every legislator in the state has, no matter what your party is, all feel they're doing their best to try and improve the lives of Vermonters. It's, uh, you know, in, in innumerable ways. I mean, I, you know, as I began with working on the minimum wage and paid family leave, we have 40,000 Vermonters who are going to benefit uh, and, and whose lives are going to improve because they're going to earn more money and contribute more to state coffers as a result. And, you know, so I, I yeah, I felt great driving home. Uh, Friday night because we had settled those two conference committees. I think all of us in our own small ways feel like we're contributing to improving the quality of life in Vermont. Is it perfect? No. But I have two sons. One's in New York, one's here, one's your deputy state's attorney. He's thrilled with helping try and solve the problems he sees every day in court. So, you know, he's thrilled to be in Vermont and and we... Uh, he's making know, good money. He can afford to live he, here. He is, but about the poor guy that down there making a minimum But our maybe, house is, you that know, has to drive to work. Again. That is where workforce development comes in, and that is yeah. how we have to have people raising and improving their skills, earning more money. There's no question. You're absolutely right about that. Would and and we're working. We're My working with got all a, those things. It's a three hundred fifty thousand dollars house. Is taxed at thirteen hundred dollars a year, a year, not a month, a whole year, on a, a house that's a year old now. I mean, we've been talking for so many years here. Yeah, problems. I won't even begin to describe what has the been taxes. Done? I can't for any, what any, like any results? Any about developing the workforce or whatever? Lots anything? Yeah. Anything to report that? Hey, this is what happened since last we year. about Social Security. Oh, bingo! Right there. Wait, wait. You know. Next Where time we'll chat further about workforce. We'll have a lot to. We have a lot to report on that workforce. Yeah, so I, have have next a, yeah I have a different direction of question up. right now go, uh, go. for Representative Hawes. <laughs> uh, from the constituent point of view, uh, one of our one of your towns, Pittsfield, which these senators don't represent. Uh, is going through a bit of a crisis for the last three months with their local government. Can you speak on that? That is a local government issue. But, you're, but you, those are your constituents. Have you touched base with them? Because it's just about, it might as well be an Irene issue for them. So, um, uh, no, I, I have read about it in the paper. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, there's, there's a, there are people who assume that um, those of us who are in the state house are responsible for every local issue. And I actually have respect for people who are elected at the local level, and I believe that they should do their jobs without, without having us show up and tell them that we know more than they do. You're, you're worried about vaping issue between the members. <laughs> you're worried about vaping? <laughs> and then you condone marijuana. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I don't think anyone is condoning marijuana. You're not? No. I think we passed it so you can do it. Well, no, we passed it because the laws against it were doing more harm than the fun. Be real. Okay. What's going to happen in 10 years from now when they have to start having more problems with the laws? I don't even smoke anything, so I don't worry about it at all. I think it's a funny thing. I don't understand. I'm going on. House Bill 751 regards fire safety and outdoor grills. Does anybody know anything about that? Um, what, what do you want to do? You, 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 what bill are you? I'm asking you. I have you know. not memorized the text of all thousand bills. I have a grill. What do you want? What, what do you want? I don't know. You know, in the paper it says. House 751. Don't blame them on the legislature. Right? No, no, I'm not blaming them. I'm saying, what is it? Excuse me. Excuse me, Nick, she has an answer for it. Nick, I need the number again. 751. Which, what's the letter? House. 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 Can you House. give a the witness? Yeah, that's that's, the that's on the Constitution. Constitution. So, 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 so
<laughs> yeah, I, that was in the paper too. So that's what's happening with it. It's, it's, it's sitting in a committee. 569. With, uh, in, a, in a stack of probably 60 bills. Is that particular committee? Yeah. I don't know exactly what it is in it. But How much lower are we going to go in the state? Is it saying legalizing prostitution? I think, oh, if I remember, I think it's just not charging the person. Are they going to be charging? Are we going to have tax on it? Are we going to have this? Challenging voice as though you think we are proposing this when you're challenging us. I'm not going to defend that. It's something I'll consider if it comes before yeah. me, and I'll weigh the pros and cons. There are some people who are suggesting that. I think what they're suggesting. <laughs> Why are you so angry? Suggesting is to not charge the it's prostitute. It's a moral thing, I guess. And here's the okay. issue: it's and, going and, and on. They want to put money on it too, probably. Make, I don't make so. the I think point. They're wanting to. Yeah. I don't know. But I think what the bill might do is cause the prostitute not to be charged, but rather, you know, there's like young girls, teenagers from Rotland who have been sucked into a prostitution. Yeah. So the idea, I think, is that it's not in the Senate, is to not charge the young woman who is the prostitute, but rather the people around her who sold her into prostitution. There is prostitution going on in the state, surprisingly. There's a lot of free stuff in this state. And then there's the, the guy that owns the, the Patriots, he's about 80 some odd years old. Yeah, crap. Who the hell cares? It's his business. What does that have to do with, with, with this? What God bless him. That's another, that's another state. <laughs> <laughs> it does. I'm sorry. Not her name, but.